For those who don't my name is Laura Misa, and I work at the Ecole Polytechnique in the theoretical spectroscopy group. And I'm a postdoc there. And so today I will present you an introduction to the beta cell beta equation. So I know you have already been, uh, you have already seen that um, in many cases we need to go beyond some approximations, and the beta cell beta seems to be uh, uh, an answer for for some systems that uh, don't depend on DFT or it's not uh, doesn't perform well. So today we we'll cover what we can do with the beta cell beta. And uh, well, this is uh, the content that I will present in my talk and give you a short motivation on uh, what I, what, why we need to, why we want to use the beta sub -beta. And uh, some guidelines for the derivation of the beta sub -beta, but of course we cannot be strict and go step by step and deep because it will take us uh, long. And then uh, most important things, uh, the approximations that we use to actually solve the beta beta in practice, and then uh, how do we actually perform the sol solutions on the code. Finally, a summary and some results. And then I will also introduce how we can uh, run in next the code that we will see this afternoon in the hands-on sessions. So before you get bored and maybe I lose you in the presentation. I want to present acknowledgements first. I know would like to acknowledge uh, my group, my group, the group. In particular, Francesco and Matteo, who are uh, my advisors as a postdoc, and uh, I work uh, together with them in my project. So, and some references that I use to to put together this talk, are in particular uh, doing very interesting books, um, interactive directions, and then a quantum theory of many microsystems. And of course, uh, this is from the group, uh, in particular, this of Matteo Gatti and Francesco. You can find the thesis in the website of the, of the group. Uh, here is the link in case you would like to take a look. And there's uh, mm -hmm. also some reviews, uh, very interesting that don't go very deep. As well. The first one covers most of the points that I will present, uh, but I say, yes, these are complementary also if you want to take a look. So let's start. I think at this point, I don't need to motivate you that much in the sense that you have already seen uh, in Valerius' talk uh, that uh, if you want to, for example, compute the optical absorption spectrum of silicon, um, and you would like to, for example, use an approximation like independent particle within RBA, using chi zero, let's say, uh, you really get a curve that's not uh, what we see in the experiment. Then uh, if, you, if you, for example, correct, uh, the independent particle approximation uh, by doing GW and uh, um, improving the energies uh, for the excitations, then uh, you will just uh, perform a shift in the spectrum. Also, you can uh, change a bit the oscillator strength if, if you do self consistency in the wave functions. But in this case, uh, we still don't get the spectrum that we want to, to reproduce. Um, and also, if, uh, if we Perform time dependent DFT within the NDA, we still miss, uh, well, we still don't uh, uh, get the right position of peak, and also we still uh, have a, a shape, a state restraint that don't uh, correspond with the experiment. So you have already seen in my talk that if you instead do with the Peter, you can really uh, capture both uh, the position of the peaks, the energies, or the positions, and also uh, you can also capture very well the, the shape of the oscillator thread. So that is, I think, <laughs> a good motivation to think of uh, using this uh, Peter. <clears throat> but uh, in a more uh, general case, when we want to, it's not always uh, that the case that we need to be Peter, but we want to in general, uh, be able to reproduce an spectrum, an experimental spectrum, 
and also understand. Uh, you know that from theory, we can uh, really focus on a specific uh, contributions and, uh, and then understand what are uh, the different contributions uh, of uh, interactions that are uh, giving uh, features in our spectrum. So this is something that we can uh, achieve uh, from theoretical spectroscopy. And eventually, we will also, also predict uh, in case it's difficult to perform ex experiments under certain um, under certain uh, circumstances. <laughs> so during my talk, I would uh, take as an example uh, the absor absorption spectrum of aluminum oxide, and this is the experimental curve. And as you have already seen in the talk of Francesco, uh, if we went to the macro macro micro connection, if we went to to calculate this spectrum, we have to compute the imaginary part of the epsilon microscope, the dielectric function. The dielectric function is not only important for the absorption spectrum, but for also, for also for other spectroscopies. So it's uh, really a key quantity that we would like to, to we need to calculate in order to, to, to describe our, our spectrum. So just this, this is just a reminder of what you have already seen so far. And um, so we define the electric functions as the, uh, the variation of the total potential with respect to an external potential, an external perturbation, which in our case is the, the light that we send, in, in the, for example, in the setup of the absorption spectrum. And in this case, we have a classical total potential that is basically the external plus a Hartree potential. And you have already seen that uh, we can calculate, if we operate and do some maths on it, we can calculate the dielectric function as uh, from the uh, polar stability chi that was already introduced uh, in the talk of uh, Valeria. So uh, basically what, what uh, the polar stability describes is the, the change in the density with respect to an external potential. And you have seen this definition in the context of uh, density functional theory, therefore, we define it with respect to the density, variation of the density. But we could also alternatively uh, define it in terms of Green's functions. So you have already learned that um, the density can be expressed in terms of Green's functions if you take the. <laughs> so, any questions so far? And also, this is courtesy of Valerius. <laughs> Uh, uh, just to remind you that chi is the chi that you can calculate uh, from time dependent DFT. This is a Dyson equation that you have already seen. And um, in the Dyson equation, you basically have to calculate the, the quantum chi zero, which is just a, a, the chi zero using the orbitals and also the energies of the offset that comes out of uh, density functional theory. And then you have the local fields and the exchange correlation. However, uh, there is not a good approximation so far for in some cases, not on, um, for, for, the, um, for the kernel. And that's why we would like to, uh, to see what we can do in the context of green functions, because if we are working with the density, we, we will always uh, like, uh, be uh, limited by how to, how to find out a good uh, description for the, for the kernel. So in the context of uh, Green's functions, we could, for example, approximate the polar stability as chi is zero, which uh, is basically the multiplication of two uh, Green's functions. Okay? In this case, I call G0, G0, because my Green's functions are non-interacting Green's functions. So it would be equivalent to uh, the k con sham, uh, the polar stability con sham that you have seen in here, okay. This is uh, this is uh, all in the orbitals uh, the, <laughs> that you get from Kirchham and the energies as well. So what do we see if we apply this approximation? So we are what we are doing is basically considering independent particle transitions because we uh, we compute the differences the energies between uh, occupied and unoccupied states. 
uh, oscillator strengths are given by this uh, numerator. And this is a So uh, as you see, the spectrum uh, in this case uh, uh, doesn't reproduce well the onset of the experiment. And also the oscillator strength, well, it's also not exactly what we, we need. So can we do better? What if uh, instead of uh, doing uh, defining um, or approximating chi as chi zero, we approximate chi as chi zero, but using the uh, range functions um, that are a result of GW approximation. So this means uh, two uh, dressed uh, Gs, not G zero. So uh, if we now um, construct of our of chi zero, but using this, uh, these Gs, we will have the um, wave functions that can be our, 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 our outcome of the relaxation of after self consistency in the GW, and also the corrected energies. What we do in practice uh, in many <laughs> occasions is that we actually approximate uh, these uh, wave functions as uh, just the conscious wave functions, and we end up with an oscillator strength that is exactly the same as. Uh, in the case uh, I showed before, but we now have a correction in energies. <laughs> Overall, we are still having, uh, we are still treating the problem as independent particle uh, transitions because we have the spectrum is, is a, is a sum of all these contributions. But uh, if, we, if, we, if we look at the result, what we get now is um, a shift to higher energies because of course we with GW we open the gap and um, however uh, the oscillator strength is very far from our experiment. So now what we are missing uh, in this description. Um, so in the examples that I showed you before we have been um, treating our problem in the base of uh, one particle excitations or one particle rings functions. And as you saw uh, yesterday with uh, Francesco, when particle rings functions only give you poles in uh, one particle excitations. Uh, this means addition energies or removal energies, as in the case uh, of, um, of uh, photomission or inverse photomission. Okay, but this is not a problem that we want to describe uh, in, in our situation where we have the absorption of a photon and the excitation of, a, of an electron, which is in an occupied state and goes to the conduction band. So here we would like to describe two particles, the electron and the hole. And a, a more, uh, a more um, excited approach will be uh, to treat this problem with two particle rings functions where a uh, pole of, uh, of this, uh, now I will call L, this polarizability, which is a four point polarizability, will give you um, basically uh, transitions uh, of uh, these neutral excitations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have already seen uh, the chi that I presented at the beginning that we discussed in that different DFT. Uh, I write it again here, which is a two-point polarizability. Depends uh, basically on, on only uh, two indexes. We can, uh, we can, in the context of uh, Green's functions, we mean uh, that chi uh, depends on two points in space and time. <coughs> and we will now work with a four point polarizability L, which is a more general object where uh, we have no locality in a space. We have uh, four points in space, one, two, three, four, and also in time in more uh, general circumstances. The interesting thing is that we can recover chi, or two-point polarizability, 
from uh, the diagonal of, of L. So this is um, so much more complicated object because it involves two body greens functions that yesterday you, you were introduced to with uh, Francesco. Uh, but we can eventually, um, from this uh, more general uh, means function, we can recover uh, our chi, which is what we really need in order to compute a spectrum. So in the experiment, we don't need L uh, because if you saw uh, in the equation that we enter in epsilon, we only need chi, but we can at the end calculate chi. What this allows us is to, um, to maybe go beyond and try to find a better approximation for, uh, for the interactions. This is just a guideline of how you can uh, get to the Venus Jupiter equation. I won't uh, tell you every step uh, in detail, but overall, um, here we have our definition that I showed you before, uh, the variation of the Green function with respect to Einstein potential, which is not local. <laughs> And uh, well, I will drop off course the indexes because it would be long otherwise. So we can um, apply uh, the trick that you have, the trick that you have seen before, uh, which is rewrite this derivative as a derivative of the inverse of the Green's function. But of course, uh, uh, by getting uh, two other Green's functions here, And we will apply the definition of our Green's function. This is the G0, which is basically kinetic plus external potential. The external potential is just the potential of uh, the nuclei. Okay. So it's uh, actually local. And, um, and the G, the total G will be, uh, we can write in the way of G0 to minus one, multiply by, sorry, this is if I forgot to. For the uh, minus the hard potential minus uh, the soft energy. So if I plug this in um, in in our definition of G, I, I get here uh, G minus one, and uh, we can uh, split basically this part on one side and the rest on the other side. Now, can someone recognize what is this that we have obtained here? K0, exactly. Or what I will define as the analogous in the context of corresponding as L0, okay? And this will be basically the propagation of the two non-interacting particles, electron and hole. Okay. We can replace uh, the L0 uh, back to in our equation and we get this. And now we can apply a chain, uh, chain rule and rewrite the external uh, the, the derivative of the wind function with respect to the external potential. As a, as a derivative of the, um, or it was like, so it was with respect to the external potential, and now we uh, derive with respect to G and G with respect to the external potential. So we go through the density. So with this, we now have two terms in here, just split it. And if you recognize here what you have obtained is basically the uh, initial definition that I gave you for L, which is a derivative of G with respect to an external non local potential. So we replace back uh, our L. And if we do all the operation correctly with the indexes, we arrive to uh, the bit of the equation where we have basically our L0 which has four indices, okay, uh, four uh, points in space and time. <coughs> and uh, in the kernel, we will have, uh, we here we will have to uh, apply our definition of a hard potential. If you remember, uh, we can um, uh, define it as, as the multiplication of the density, well, over the variation of the density with respect to the Coulomb potential. So the density, we can write it in terms of uh, G, 
So we will have here uh, V times G. So if we apply the derivative of V times G uh, over G, we get uh, only V with many deltas. <laughs> And this is uh, the derivative of sigma of self energy with respect to the main structure. Any questions so far? Okay. So if you notice, what we got is a nice equation in the same way, it's very similar to. Uh, we have seen before for an independent EFP, where we also have a, a nice equation. But uh, now, of course, this is four points instead of two points. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> then we have here the kernel uh, that, uh, that includes the Coulomb interaction and the, the delta epsilon, uh, the, the, the derivative of epsilon with respect to the Green's function which uh, we will have to see what we do with it or to deal with it. So in order for you to get an intuition what, uh, what we are describing, is, uh, so if, if we just consider L0, uh, which is the, the, the multiplication of the Green's functions, we will describe as we saw before, the propagation of the two independent uh, particles doesn't mean to non inter so, so it would be address electron address hole. So this would be the propagation of two quasi particles. So it doesn't have to be like a propagation of a non interacting single particle defined in terms of a G0, which is a non interacting green function. So, so this is really, uh, you're supposed to take really the quasi particles, but to the best, uh, best uh, G which you have. So ideally, by defining, then you have to see which approximation you use for G. Because ideally you will have, a, you know, we, we, we do sometimes uh, an approximation to, because we cannot calculate G because it includes also uh, sigma. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's also a Dyson equation, G. <laughs> so it's like, a, yes, it's like a rabbit hole. It's like, a, in order to define L, you need G, but G, uh, we will have to approximate it. But if you have an extra G, it will be uh, the electron plus uh, all the, um, how to say, the dress electron or dress hole, which will be the electron plus all the screening that uh, around it uh, as a result of uh, the integration of, of this electron. I don't know if I am clear. So, uh, so, so uh, just the inductivity, you're supposed always to use the contrast. Uh, <laughs> Uh, of it is, but here uh, in principle, uh, you can use it, but you can also use a uh, you know, properly use uh, a better approximation for the energy. Yes, yeah. so uh, so in EFT, you define chi zero as you said as uh, uh, the multiplication of two uh, of let's say the in base in the basis of the constant orbitals. Okay, and uh, well, okay, this equation considering this is exact as uh, the same as uh, the Peter Peter equation if you get the exact uh, exchange correlation, okay? But in the context of the Peter Peter, because we define L as uh, two Gs, but we haven't done any approximation to G yet, ideally you want, you want to find it in terms of, uh, you know, doing an approximation in terms of G0, G0, which will be the chi zero of, uh, of time dependent DFT. So it's not the same, uh, in this case, it's not the same. It's like a little bit more complex. Okay, so we also have the uh, kernel where we have our uh, quantum interaction, which gives us uh, local fields as you saw also analogous, uh, in an analogous way in the uh, independent density pressure theory. And we have a uh, 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 derivative of uh, so, uh, sigma with respect to Green's function. And this, uh, you will see later on, that uh, gives us uh, the screen uh, Coulomb interaction under approximations. Uh, sorry, uh, here in L0 is a product of two Green functions, one, 
one, two, and two, one, the electron are all together, right? Uh, where this uh, minus i comes from? From the definition. So you can define with minus or not. What do you mean? Uh, so you, you can, when you define a Green's function, you can, uh, there is some, uh, in some literature, you will put the i uh, on this side. And other times you will put the, the i in here. It's just the way that you define it. However, well, these are complex variables, so I is a constant. Because, thing. because we have two G together, they are going to product. So if there is an I for one, they should be multiplied and cancel out and uh, convert to minus. Yeah, in the definition of G, usually there is a, a yeah. minus I as well. And so they cancel out, as you say, then the, okay. you, to, you reput the I <laughs> in order to, yeah. To define a, a two particle. However, it is in, in L node is not the G12, G21. It's G12, G34. Yes. Four points. Okay, yeah. It's that's... not uh, good. Oh, okay. So uh, you, you say the. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, a loop. Uh, no, no, no. It's open. Okay, so, so yeah, they are independent, two yeah. parallel. Okay, yeah. So okay. if you see, it depends on the four indexes. Oh, yeah. Because we started. From uh, from a general expression of uh, energy, which depends on two points in space, and uh, an external potential, which depends also on uh, two points yeah. in space. So basically, one electron and one hole, which are not non-interacting. There are yes, non-interacting. But these are dress electrons and dress holes. So this is yeah. Okay. These are not G zero G zero. The one that I presented at the beginning defined in terms of the Gaussian orbitals. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? So, okay, so at the end, the kernel will give us the interaction that we were missing in the description of our, our initial um, two examples that I presented. So, let's see what we can do with the kernel because. We had difficulties before to calculate. So can you imagine now calculating these derivatives? We will have to do approximations. And uh, one approximation that one can make is to uh, define uh, self-energy as uh, uh, G times V as, uh, which, wait, the comment is missing here, uh, which will be a uh, time-dependent hard free fork. So this will be basically uh, continuing only Coulomb interaction, and um, and if if we plug back into the into Vitsa Peter equation, you will see that these two terms don't cancel out because we have uh, different indexes. So even though we do, um, we are using a. Uh, we are doing uh, an approximation that, uh, that includes uh, V, uh, in this case, the, the two points that we are putting, that we are connecting through V, if, if we will plot, uh, for example, a Feynman driver, which I'm not an expert, will be different from the points that you connect with uh, this term. Therefore, you will still get a, a four point uh, complexity in your kernel, in this case. Another approximation that is actually the standard approximation that we do when we talk about Peter is uh, to do uh, to, the, to find sigma in the GW approximation. And uh, if we put back uh, our uh, the, uh, approximation for sigma, we can uh, actually uh, calculate this derivative as this. Uh, First, plus uh, the derivative of W with respect to Green's function, which we actually uh, neglect because well, there are many uh, uh, many uh, approaches but, uh, to, to, to justify why we neglect this. But let's say that this will be uh, second order. We give second order contributions. We are still in linear response. Okay. Well, second order in the book. Hmm? Second order in W. 
Okay, so with this definition, we can reroute of uh, with circuit equation, and now um, we have uh, our Coulomb interaction in here and our screen Coulomb interaction in in the second part. Okay. And um, we have to do further approximations because if you still see here, we have four points in space and also in time because, uh, because we haven't done anything with respect to time. Um, so our approximation now would be that we will consider a static screen, which means that uh, we can, Rewrite or uh, or omega, for example, where our screening as um, it's a function of the two positions of the two points in space and uh, a difference uh, in time. So we will have the frequency there. Okay, and we will uh, consider that uh, only uh, all the all the different all all the Different frequencies that we get out of uh, in different parts of the of the bit orbiter are um, are the same. So we have just one frequency, and this frequency uh, will be basically uh, the frequency, for example, when we can calculate W at uh, at zero. So just uh, summarizing, we approximate the screen to be static. We don't have a dependence on omega. We consider that all the uh, time differences that we get from the four, uh, so we will have two time differences, one for the hole, one for the electron in each of the L's. These two time differences, which gives me two omegas, will be the same. And uh, we will write our equation, or the Mr. equation, uh, basically, Considering uh, the dependency with just one frequency. And just to compare also with diagrams that uh, I think uh, you saw in the talk of the time dependent DFT when I talk, uh, talk about to see the equation. Uh, so it's very similar in the sense that we are obtaining at the end, this is an equal, by the way, not a minus, uh, a kernel which is four points. Uh, where uh, the Coulomb part connects these uh, two points, these four points in this uh, in this sense, let's say, and the screen Coulomb interaction connects also these points, but in the uh, in this other sense. So even though so, uh, if you see W and uh, the screening and the Coulomb interaction are two points, we cannot reduce the complexity of the whole equation to, uh, to only two points because the two points that we are treating here are not the same as the ones that we are treating in the second the second the yeah. uh, Do you have any idea that uh, what we miss by, uh, by neglecting the frequency dependency in W? Uh, because this W so, is important part, mm -hmm. actually. You what? will basically assume that your screening is instantaneous and uh, just one shot. Exactly. Uh, is there something uh, can be captured if we consider a dynamic? So, um, or the whole uh, there are approximations because in order to consider it dynamic, is uh, becomes <laughs> the makes the Vitas and Peter equation almost impossible to solve. And there are some approximations that, for example, used uh, three body grains functions to try to capture uh, this frequency dependent and in a more efficient way than uh, treating explicitly within the Vitas and Peter equation. Because, yes, it's, it would be for uh, um, basically you will have to solve for all the points. And also all the frequencies. This is uh, yeah, of course, yeah. It would be more demanding, but uh, well, at the end of the day, do we obtain something? Do we gain something? Well, typically, uh, so 
by there are four points, so four space time points. Yeah. But since the system you always suppose uh, time invariance, so what matters is the time differences. So you you will have in a full uh, frequency dependent better salpeter equation free omega. So typically t two minus t one, t three minus t one, t four. Since the system is uh, invariance, but then so on free frequencies you have to integrate over two frequencies. So there is one, say, external frequency over which you want to, like in the in the better salpeter like uh, here. So you see omega is in the left hand side and the, in all the quantities <coughs> in the right hand side. But then in the integral, in the second integral shown there, beyond the day for integration of the spatial points, there are also two other omega integrations. So it's very complex to solve a question like this. So this is the reason why, uh, as Laura told you, we uh, we do the static approximation. The, the interaction is supposed to be static. So just between this electron and hole, we consider this a static, right? Sorry? Yeah, just for this part, for this uh, inter for the so w part. Yes. Yeah. The exchange part is... Uh, it's in the balance. No, but it's it's part not a part of the yeah. balance. Yeah. 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 To do the development, we usually put also, well, the, the, some data to complete with also the time dependency, but the uh, poor <laughs> part is yeah. it's not time dependent. The, the, uh, I have to say that there is uh, a way to write a, a complete uh, dynamical better salpeter equation in only one frequency, but you have to rewrite all these uh, quantities in a very complex way. So there, it exists a way, however, it's not that uh, straightforward. Here in this pool, we will stop the uh, approximation. I will write on the on the board the, the equation with the three frequencies in a moment. But to answer your question about what we possibly miss, yes. one thing that is obvious immediately, it's the following. If uh, W is static and V is also static, that means that the only frequency dependent comes from L0, right? Yeah. So that means that in L, you can have only as many poles as there are in L0, right? Yeah. Because uh, the other is static, it not, it not creates new pores. It can move them around, change all the possibility, but it cannot add any other number yes, of pores, right. right? So in L0, we have all this uh, um, uh, transition from the balance to conduction states, right? Yes. So we have all these pores. So already, for example, a double excitation, which means you have with the photon and you excite two electrons, this will be another pole and you cannot get it because you only have as many poles as in the L0. So already double excitation, you will not, uh, you will not get it, or multiple excitation. Yeah. We are, we are, we, and we are still talking about the linear response, right? Yeah, not yeah. second harmonic. Really, yeah. one photon absorption, but you excite two. Yeah, yeah. It will be a new pole. You don't get it. You also satellites. So, yeah. good. Hmm? Because satellites, we don't get them because because this approximation, as I just said, we only have the poles and the transitions that we include in L0, but if you would have also a frequency dependent in omega, you will have uh, also some satellites. Yeah. Are we supposed to have satellite in optical absorption as well? Yeah. Yes, so, well, like yeah. always. Okay. This is in, uh, in elastic x-ray. Yeah, I understood that you showed something that, but I didn't know that. Uh... Uh, but you can have, uh, for example, you, excite an electron and the whole at the same time you excite another uh, another electron hole so you, it's a free particle process mm -hmm. so, but yesterday francesco told you about uh, the the satellites and the self energy you know so yeah. if the self energy is static you you will have just only the uh, normalization of the quasi particle peak and uh, no satellites when you introduce the omega dependence you will have this Satellites, these satellites can be quasi particle plus palmo, quasi particle plus electron hole pair. In this case, is electron hole plus, electro plus electron hole pair or other excitation, electron hole plus palmo, everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay.
Okay. This is in case you want to play with more frequency, you will have a two integrations. Okay, so we also have to uh, perform an approximation to L0 because, as I said before, it is the multiplication of two free expansions, but uh, the dress free expansion. So, as we know, if the, we calculate the green Dyson equation, we, we also have to, to, it would be like a problem without an end. So, um, we will have to approximate, and the usual uh, approximation is just to consider uh, the Gs as uh, the result of uh, the Green's functions uh, that we get out of a GW approximation. Uh, so, with this, I write here um, the L0. This L0 will be equal uh, to the chi 0 uh, GW that I presented at the beginning. Uh, where we have uh, the wave functions uh, in case we want, you want to relax uh, the wave functions uh, after uh, GW and the energies uh, from GW. Or you can also uh, generally use a scissor operator, which is uh, shift to the gap and gives you the correct gap and uh, the rest of the uh, uh, H1s. Usually, again, we approximate uh, the wave functions by just the uh, equation of orbitals. So we end up uh, here with a three to string by the result of the DFT equation of orbitals. How do we solve this in practice? OK, because <laughs> let me remind you that now we uh, reduce the problem uh, to uh, calculating L. With the static, uh, with the static screening here, uh, with static screen, we reduce to on only uh, one frequency, but we still have four points in space and one frequency. So if you you use if you will use the traditional uh, way of uh, getting, for example, like in the case of chi, which is inverting um, on this thing, you will have to invert a four point. Uh, in space object, all the complexity of including wave functions and so on, so plus uh, do this inversion for every frequency. So this is uh, basically impossible to solve that way. And uh, there are some tricks that we would like to do, and they are related to the fact that we would like to avoid uh, the working with uh, necessarily with the four coordinates in space. And also, uh, Try to do the, the solution for, uh, let's say, uh, invert just one equation or resolve everything for and get all the frequencies for free, let's say, just not having to do a solution for every frequency. So, one of the tricks that we do in this uh, to overcome this challenge is to uh, rewrite our polarizability that is in real space, in the transition space. Okay, so the, we will basically go to the basis of the transitions instead of uh, the, the position. What is this uh, transition space? So it, we, can, we can imagine that we will have uh, our system with occupied and unoccupied states, and uh, we can uh, uh, define as a basis all possible transitions that we can have, okay, uh, from, for example, in this case, I just consider uh, to, from balance to conduction. This will mean that we will have all balance uh, states, conduction states, and uh, also uh, for different uh, gate points. Okay. And with this, we can do some, uh, we, we, we can multiply by, uh, by this wave function in this, in, this, uh, in this basis, and we will get or L uh, defined in terms of, uh, of transitions. So now with this definition, I think I don't have time to <laughs> cover everything, but we can uh, basically um, reduce, I presented here again, uh, reduce the definition of L0 and the, the approximation that we mentioned. And we can basically, um, since many of these uh, wave functions would be orthogonal, 
reduced uh, this to this equation. So now here, what we have is one because we have two deltas. And uh, in the denominator, we will have the energies of uh, the two, uh, uh, the energies of the two levels, uh, which, we, which we are considering for the transitions, okay? At this point, there is no need to define uh, N1 and N2 like occupied and unoccupied state. This is a more general concept, concept uh, where all the possible transitions are uh, considered. And uh, we have these functions, which will give us, uh, tell us um, the occupation. So L0 with this definition would be a diagonal in uh, this space, in the transition space. So imagine we have a matrix of uh, N, uh, N1 and 2 times N3 and 4 transitions. We will get L0 as a diagonal. Again, it will depend on omega. Uh, we can compute also our uh, matrix elements for um, or uh, for B, the Coulomb and the spring Coulomb interaction in this way, which will also depend on the transitions. And we can rewrite our beta sub beta in this way. So now to make it uh, things easier, let's just uh, forget about all the, in, uh, all the indexes and just uh, since we know that they are matrices, we can write this way on the terms. And uh, something that comes up uh, here is that we basically, uh, by doing uh, this uh, change of basis, get rid of the frequency dependence in the kernel. And we only have a dependence uh, on omega and L0. This is something that we liked because then it means when we are simplifying the problem, we don't have to calculate the kernel for all frequencies. Okay, the second strategy to uh, to make uh, this, this solution viable, uh, vis vis feasible is to uh, reformulate um, the beta of Peter as an eigenvalue problem. So for this, we'll have to do some math. Basically, you know that we can um, reformulate this in uh, this way just by uh, reorganizing the terms. And um, so we get to this point. So here, maybe uh, we can replace our previous definition of L0, the one that I just uh, achieved before, after uh, we give uh, transformation to transition space, uh, where we had uh, the energy difference in the denominator. And now since we have two events, when we have here uh, multiplied by the identity, which is the, basically the deltas that I presented before, the delta between two transitions. Because again, these are matrices that are uh, N, uh, N1 and 2 times N3 and 4. Another way of writing this is uh, uh, in this way, so the inverse. And I do this because maybe you start uh, being familiarized with this equation and <laughs> Because if, if we want to diagonalize the problem, we would like to write it uh, in terms of uh, an exotonic, which we define uh, an exotonic Hamiltonian. And if we see this equation in this way, and we find the exotonic Hamiltonian, like uh, in the diagonal, the, the energy difference between the two transitions, uh, the transition between the two levels that we want to consider, plus the column uh, minus the screen column interaction, we can replace in here this and this, and we will write uh, the equation in this way. Do you remember what is this L now? I mean, have you seen before this L? In Francesco Stock, he defined. It looks like kernel, looks like kernel, the function kernel. It's the inverse of the kernel. Is yes, is uh, in Francesco Stock, he defined also the Green's function. In this way, let me make it more familiar for you now. If we now uh, consider that the solution of the exotonic Hamiltonian will be these eigenvectors, 
uh, with uh, these energies, and we make an approximation and say let's uh, make, uh, let's consider that the, the exonic Hamiltonian is emission. We will get this relation that you already know. We can uh, replace this one for this, and uh, in here uh, the Hamiltonian for uh, the energies that we get out of lab analyzing it. And this is the Lehmann representation that Francesco showed. But uh, for this is for uh, L instead of for G. Okay. Uh, okay, but what have I done here? I mentioned that I did the approximation that the Hamiltonian is a mission and therefore um, and therefore uh, identity is uh, defined like this. But what does it mean in terms of our uh, definition for the Hamiltonian? It means that we, we have taken the transitions, which are n1 to n2, balance to conduction only. So only resonant transitions, okay? So this is the same picture that I showed you before. So only transitions from balance to conduction, okay? So if we consider only this, which in fact is not necessarily true because our exonic Hamiltonian is bigger than this. So we are only considering one part of, uh, of, or of the total Hamiltonian, where only how we are introducing a resonant uh, transitions. We can have also anti-resonant transitions, the opposite from conductions to balance, and this is what we call the tandem goff approximation. Okay, so under this approximation, we, we can replace explicitly now, uh, instead of a, energy of N1 minus N2, uh, we have the energies of the conduction minus the balance. This delta that tells me that this part is diagonal in my transition space. And then I have also the calculate the matrix elements for uh, the Coulomb and the screen Coulomb interaction which will uh, depend on the balance conduction to uh, balance conduction. So in this context, now yes, the Hamiltonian is a mission, we get the eigen vectors. From the eigen vectors and eigen mm -hmm. values, we, we, we can calculate L, the four point polarized method, and uh, we just diagonalize once, and we can calculate L for all frequencies just by uh, this. Uh, I have maybe a more general question. Uh, is the lemma representation also valid if your uh, Hamiltonian is not Hermitian? So lemma representation, uh, mathematician, but is a way of uh, writing the Green's functions. Okay. So maybe your question is: Is this uh, approximation exact? So no, it's not exact. So this is if we consider that uh, the matrix the um, it's not Hamiltonian is a mission. We are doing approximation and we are leaving out uh, some part of the Hamiltonian, which is actually these parts. So if I will write this in this way, yes, then uh, it's, it's exact. And S there, what is that? Sorry? What is ah, S in the yes. middle? Let me explain you. So we have again our uh, Hamiltonian. This is resonant, the reality resonant. And we will have the coupling between resonant and anti resonant. Okay. Um, now, if you see here, I, I wrote again uh, Hamiltonian in a general way, only considering n1 and n2, and n3 and 4. And uh, I'm writing here, but if uh, if you diagonalize the Hamiltonian, if it's not a mission, we will have to diagonalize for uh, two uh, twice for left and here back for to get the right vectors. Is and this, and this will be the overlap matrix that you get uh, when you um, when you cut you cut. So this is just a no, so instead of the identity matrix that you will get, you will now get an, uh, an overlap matrix because these are not orthogonal anymore. Okay. Uh, at the search, what is the E lambda? 
Yes. Uh, what, what question? Uh, what is the index? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so this is the matrix. So when, when we diagonalize it, we get the eigenvectors for all uh for all possible transitions. So this will be um actually a matrix where all columns will be the lambdas. Let's say we can think of in this way. Uh, and all the lambdas is what we call the excitons. So each uh, each solution, each a lambda will be an excitonic uh, eigen, eigen vector. An excited C. Um, yeah, but because within the, the many body picture, uh, you will have to to compute always uh, summation to over all the possible excitations to to actually describe the excitation of an electron hole pair. I don't know if I meant. So we cannot think anymore uh, in this independent particle from uh, in this uh, independent particle point of view where each excitation or each is is, is a one transition. Now we have a many body uh, picture where we have to consider everything uh on, how to say this uh, we will have to consider uh, that all uh, extons give uh give uh give place to to a one excitation let's say no i don't know if this makes sense in this way in practical ways what we have basically is that a lambdas will be the different uh, poles the different peaks that we have in our spectrum and the excitons, uh, the excitonic uh, Wi-Fi uh, vectors, uh, will be related to the oscillator strength that we get in our spectrum. But you have to do a mixing between all the all the possible lambdas to to get your spectrum. It's not like you can get one lambda, and out of that lambda. It's one transition, and there you get uh, one excitation, and then you get your spectrum from just one lambda. That's clear. Okay. Uh, I have a question. From which parameter uh, you get the excitonic binding energy? Uh, okay, uh, so this um, we can think that if we do in the random particle approximation, which is basically, I will come here, sorry. Considering all the diagonal part of the Hamiltonian, you will get uh, your your spectrum with an onset or energies given on the oh, In that terms, your spectrum uh, will modify uh, your uh, your position. Okay, so uh, you can calculate your binding energy by uh, just looking at the difference of. Uh, the first uh, peak or the peak that you are interested in when you consider only independent particle approximation and when you would expect when you consider the whole um, exotic Hamiltonian. So, so if we neglect this uh, uh, interaction part, we, we get back uh, the. Exactly. Yeah. Because if you see this. If we get just this part, then I will have here. Uh, well, uh, I will. I will directly have a diagonal uh, matrix. We'll go back to. So if I neglect the rest, I will directly have a diagonal. So uh, yeah. in my exotic uh, Hamiltonian, and therefore I can calculate L, the total L in terms. Of, so I can approximate L, the total L as L0, which is uh, this part. And L0 was uh, our original approximation uh, of uh, GG, G0, 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 particle. OK, yeah. let's, uh, yes. Did you think about the of diagonal terms? I'm sorry? Just repeat what the of diagonal terms are doing. Yes, these are coupling, uh, so these are resonant and anti resonant uh, parts of the Hamiltonian, and this coupling couples uh, positions that are resonant and anti resonant. 
So if you have q equals zero, you could uh, have that uh, you only need to this, uh, you got this part, and then you can demonstrate this from just like here, like a complex conjugate. Um, hmm. Good question. So I've always uh, worked with Tandankov. Uh, yeah, for the spectrum, we take the diagonal, right? That's what we need. So for the spectrum, in a normal way of solving, we only take this part, which is not allowed. So it's just a block. Okay, and for free, since this will be a mission, we get for and But then the coupling, I don't know if you have experience in O2. Yes, we, um, yeah. uh, you, you don't see much effect, uh, for example, in optical absorption, the telescopy, but on energy loss, it may add an uh, effect. Mm -hmm. Would you find the shape of the spectrum? Typically, you, you know. Uh, no, so, the resonant part, uh, let's say, is, uh, let's say, you have um, uh, positive energies. So, while uh, this cutting part coupled the negative and positive energies part of the spectrum. Yeah. So, you may have an effect, of, for example, atomic equal zero. In this uh, case of a metal, you can have an effect because the part negative energy. Mm -hmm. okay. And in Valeria, you did also calculation with the finite system. No, that is also important. No? Yeah. Molecules there is uh, very important. Yeah, that would be important. And uh, sometimes, uh, I found that once we apply this uh, coupling, actually, parts, uh, there are uh, negative excitation. Yeah. And it is, a, I don't know, what's the, I mean, what is the mathematical problem behind that? But there are negative excitation. Applying Tom Dankov, it's removed, so you can have everything okay. But to what extent it's reliable? No idea. Because it's not a mission anymore. You are studying Hamiltonian. If you include coupling, it's not a mission. So no, but I mean, I mean, we can imagine already to to let's say to uh, to neglect the diode block, no? Mm -hmm. And then the Hamiltonian keeps a medium mm -hmm. because the resonant and the anti resonant are medium, and uh, is asking what's the meaning of the other uh, block there? No? So the anti resonant block. This is the your question, no? Mine? Okay, please. Okay. No, it was no, it was questioning about the effect of the beyond Tandankov, so the coupling. But if you ask, for example, what's the meaning of this negative? So uh, they, they are neg uh, transition and negative energies. So, oh, I have such an intuition that uh, considering this coupling block is the interaction between transition from valence to uh, empty virtual state and virtual to uh, valence. So maybe the second part is stronger than the first part. This is why that we have uh, such a negative. Uh, it's because of time reversal that you need to. Exactly. Yeah. So that is the point. So yeah. this is uh, somehow related also to propagation, in, uh, propagation uh, uh, reversing time. An electron or propag reverse propagating in time, much like uh, in the single particle green function, you can imagine the whole like an electron propagating back in time. Yeah. No, but, but in fact, if you have time reversal, the anti resonant is uh, equal to the rest. In fact, we don't calculate, we know what is the result. The anti resonant part is minus uh, yeah. uh, the resonant part the star. So, it's not, uh, it's not um, a problem. The coupling mix them, the two, which will be the real solution. So if you write down the chi, you will have them uh, together because you cannot decouple. This comes from the fact that when you write the two particle Green's function, you cannot distinguish when you apply the two field operator, annihilation and creation, <clears throat> and the other order creation idea because you can create a particle and a hole 
And at the same time, you create a hole and a particle. You cannot distinguish them. So if you put all together, you will have them both. And it's difficult to have an intuition why, for example, from the independent particle picture, you have also, you have positive and negative. But what we can always say, like uh, uh, Valerio said about energy loss, in energy loss, it turns out to be important. And the point is that because in energy loss, you specifically look at the inverse of the epsilon, right? So that means that there will be epsilon one and epsilon two, both applying to know the imaginary part of epsilon. Um, yeah, the imaginary part of the inverse epsilon. So in order to know the imaginary part of epsilon minus one, you need to know both epsilon one and epsilon two. And epsilon one and epsilon two are related by Kramer's chronic. If you know one, you know the other. But this Kramer's chronic are integral between minus infinity and infinity. So in order to know epsilon two at uh, uh, two electron volt, you need to know epsilon one also in principle on minus uh, 200. And negative energies. And negative, you, you, so you, negative, you mix them up. Negative energy transitions. Okay. Now, I think your, your question was even a little bit different because you asked if you don't put them down both, it might happen that the binding energy become even bigger yeah. than your gap. And so you have a negative, that was your negative energies, right? That's a problem. And uh, it's sort of an instability. We, 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 we are discovering a system that becomes even lower energy than the ground state. So the system doesn't want to stay there. Yeah. So it's difficult to describe in that case. No, without... but uh, I mean, this is uh, an, an hypothetical system that people think can exist. Yeah, yeah, it's course. called uh, the excitonic insulator. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an instability in which, uh, uh, so the, the hypothesis, okay, this is uh, also, it is called uh, Mott insulator number two because Mott uh, predicted a lot of insulators. Then uh, <laughs> he did the list of insulators. Then so only some of them had success. And this, this is the Mott insulator, which you have lower upper band, uh, upper uh, upper bands. And then there is this Mott insulator, which is uh, like, more probably called the excitonic insulator. You have to imagine. That in, in this case, so if you have a, a negative binding energy, so it means that uh, the, the system uh, will pref as ground state will prefer to form excitons, much more like uh, in a superconductor, where you have the normal ground state and the superconducting ground state. The superconducting ground state is by spontaneous formation of Cooper pairs. And this ground state in this state is lower than the normal ground state, so that the system under a certain temperature prefer to stay in the superconducting state and the normal state. And in the case of, uh, of uh, here, the excitonic case, you can have uh, situations in which uh, typically you have to introduce a discoupling, in which uh, you have uh, a situation in which the, the system, by, for, by spontaneous formation of exciton, you minimize the energy. So that your normal ground state is not anymore the real ground state because there is a lowest energy state, and the lowest energy state is a state of in which exciton are, uh, are formed, like Cooper pair are there. The system prefer to see. So this is a situation. Uh, I think uh, okay. I uh, I have found a situation like th like this. In my calculation, but most of the time I was thinking a numerical error, a numerical the quality error. of. I never trusted it was a real exitonic insulator. So if you if you meet such a situation, okay. Yeah. Uh, Is it clear or not? Actually, I had a benchmark. Carefully evaluate if you have found the finally this mod insulator number two <laughs> or is a chimera. <laughs> yeah, it was a set of uh, fuller in actually cages that I had uh, some benchmark on them. And uh, for C20 and C40, actually I observed there, there are negative excitation energies. I mean, within the absorption, but- uh, yeah. well, How would you detect this experimental such a- <laughs> the... Good question. So, for example, a, an excitonic insulator, uh, you could detect a, a, a charge density wave 
uh, at the wavelength of, uh, of the exciton. So if, if for example, the exciton, uh, the electron hole, uh, the electron hole preferred to localize uh, on one atom, uh, another atom, suppose for example, I don't know, an ionic system, uh, yeah. NACL, you prefer to localize the hole or on, um, on NA and the electron on CL. And so the, the, so the exciton has a wavelength. So, so you have more density, you, you see a charge density wave in which you place more, uh, more charge on chlorine, chlorine atoms, less charge on sodium atom. And so you see appearing in the excitonic uh, insulator phase, a charge density wave overimposed over the, uh, the periodicity, the ionic periodicity of the system. So, uh, uh, so in this case, okay, yes, the same, it has the same periodicity, but you can have a situation in which you have an, uh, an over periodicity. So for example, a two by two by two charge density wave respect to the elementary cell. This is what, uh, so, uh, so a periodicity, which um, let's say the system, ionically the system has a certain periodicity, the exciton has a, a super periodicity, and you will see a charge density wave with this with the periodicity of the exciton. So there are some systems that are suspected to be excitonic insulator, uh, insulators. One of them is uh, uh, titanium diselenide. Uh, which is supposed to be so a system uh, which is supposed to which has a, a let's say is a, a titan on the selenide is supposed to be um, so a small bank gap insulator the bank gap in the normal state should be 0 0.1 0 0.2 electron volt and the exciton binding energy is larger than the bank gap, so suppose it is 0 0.3, so that the system would, could prefer to form exciton instead to be in the normal state, it would prefer because the exciton binding energy is larger than the bank gap. And so you spontaneously form exciton so that the, norm, the, the ground state is not anymore the normal, is the excitonic. However, these are hypotheses, it's not confirmed. So. Experimentally and theoretically, so it's uh, there are a lot of papers on this system, but no one uh, clarifying. And uh, for just imagine that we have a molecule with a donor and acceptor functional group on both sides. This system is supposed to have charge migration and uh, basically uh, the charge trans. Yeah. So this is a there are a subject of such a. They are subject of such a negative. I mean, this uh, type of mm. insulator. But this no, is called uh, because this okay because this uh, this system is intrinsically would like to uh, have communicate between Homo and Lumo because of this charge transfer character that they have. So uh, is it is it uh, can we say that okay we might have some excited states uh, more favorable than the ground state? No element to say that, in my opinion. I mean, charge transfer states are, uh, are uh, regularly described by the Belsar Peter, both at the time dunk of and also with the coupling. I don't That's think not... it is obvious to imagine them as an obvious uh, candidate, I mean, better than others, to mm -hmm. form necessarily this instability, which but... again is a, is a, is it's a possibility, but we don't know if it actually exists. You have to distinguish obviously between what can be a ground state. So when you form a molecule, like for example, an ACL, you transfer. Uh, there is a transfer of charge, but this is the ground state. Then you have to distinguish it. Um, under an excitation, there should be further charge transfer. So yeah. So in the case of a molecule where, where you have a donor and acceptor, normally there is a transfer of charge, and this is the normal ground state, and it's not an accident. So well, the situation is, uh, yeah. Uh, this excitonic insulator, has, so I did the wrong example before in ACL. No, it's something that uh, uh, the excitonic insulator should be beyond 
the, uh, the symmetry of uh, the Hamiltonian of the system, ionic symmetry. So it should appear as a super periodicity, not that the periodicity. The NACL is already, oh, in NACL, you should already expect a transfer of uh, charge from one atom from the, uh, from the donor to the acceptor. Yes, we can continue with the yes, discussion yes. in during the coffee break. So let me do a wrap up, a summary of everything that we have learned. We started with our definition of the dielectric function, okay, in terms of the chi, the polarizability, the two point polarizability. The two point polarizability. Uh, of course, at the end, we will calculate it in a reciprocal space for GEG prime. This will be a matrix. And uh, and of course, chi must be also calculated in reciprocal space. In particular, in our example, in our rubin oxide example, we were interested in computing absorption, uh, which was the imaginary part of the microscopic epsilon, uh, which um, is defined as the inverse of the inverse electric function evaluated at g, g prime component equals zero. The head of uh, <laughs> uh, for the limit of Q that goes to zero because we are approximating and doing dipole approximation. Okay. And so let's uh, review. We can calculate now uh, the order epsilon minus one as um, in terms of uh, sky, but also in terms of uh, L or four points, uh, also for uh, the zero zero component. Um, so I have to remind you that I have shown you before uh, L uh, in terms of uh, express in terms of the transitions uh, basis, but now we have to go back and express this in real or reciprocal space. So we have to um, to, free, uh, to multiply by wave functions and Fourier transform, and uh, and then we get oscillator strengths. And these are quite similar to the ones that show, uh, shown by Matteo yesterday. Uh, you saw the in a similar way as he described. And we also have very important here um, the uh, solutions of the uh, exotonic Hamiltonian, the vectors, A lambdas. And, and if, you, um, if you see what we will actually have is um, is a mixing of all uh, this can be interpreted as independent particle transitions, and what we'll uh, do uh, here when we multiply and sum over all transitions is that we will mix all these uh, independent particle transitions. In an analogous way, we can therefore define uh, the independent particle variability uh, considering. Uh, Without considering the lambdas, just the, as the in terms of the um, <clears throat> say the matrix elements of uh, valence uh, to conduction transition of valence to conduction. Of course, I have omitted here my whole uh, description the k points uh, in order to make it more uh, compact uh, with the notation. But you know that here we have k minus uh, q, and in the other side you have also k. And uh, just one, also one thing, uh, the denominators, uh, the energies, the poles of the energies that we will get here are uh, the excitonic energies. Uh, and in here, we just have uh, the, the transition energies between balance to conduction. Of course, this is under the uh, Tamnank of okay. And we can then calculate our uh, dielectric matrix, both. Uh, for the beta and and also for uh, the independent particle. And so let me show you some results. Going back to original original example, uh, we have um, the absorption spectrum now uh, calculated with the beta Peter. So if you see, this is the gray uh, line. Um, we get a very, uh, a, a, the good description of the position of the peak. 
Uh, of course, the uh, intensity uh, is not exactly the same, but uh, overall, uh, the silicon string of I will broaden, broaden, broaden a little bit more spectrum, I will get uh, something more uh, similar to, to the absorption, uh, calculate ex exper experiment, uh, experiment of absorption. We can also calculate uh, X ray absorption, where uh, here you have like <laughs> the same mechanism, but now instead of exciting a balanced electron, you will be exciting a, a core, of, in this case, semi-core. No, in this case, it's a gauge, so it's, you can score. Uh, and uh, if you compare it to experiments, it's quite good. Uh, it's quite quite good description. In fact, uh, this uh, the three restraints is uh, very well uh, described. Um, we also compare two other calculations that they, um, people do in the context of X-ray absorption, which are based on a core hole approximation. So they have a pseudo potential created with a core hole. And then they compute a density functional theory uh, with the relaxation of the density and uh, calculate the spectrum out of it. And uh, we get uh, the comparison between the orange and the gray, orange is Mr. Peter, uh, is uh, quite good as well. So, um, ah, and by the way, uh, I also here I show uh, the GW spectrum that I showed before, just to to so you can see the difference uh, when you uh, when you include uh, the correlation, the kernel, the interaction between the electron and the hole. This will be the like, independent particle. And uh, again, going back to the question of how can you calculate the, the binding energy of the exciton, then you have to see which is the excitonic energy that you can get. Uh, the first excitonic energy you can do with this spectrum, let's say, with the bit Peter, and then let's check with the, uh, with, the, with the independent particle, and from there you can uh, you can get the binding energy. This case is a bit more complicated because the first excitons are dark. So as you can see here, uh, in the spectrum, there is a pre-peak that we don't get uh, in our calculation because um, we are considering uh, only dipole approximation. And uh, because of the vibrational properties, there could be here some contributions from uh, transitions uh, from the 2S states, which is the KH. This is 2S to the bottom of the conduction band, which is uh, also S uh, character. So we don't capture with uh, with this arbiter, but if we do a, a similar uh, calculation now uh, in, in elastic X-ray scattering, which is uh, the here we compute the last function uh, minus, minus the imaginary part of uh, epsilon minus one. Uh, again, uh, we have the experiment with the pre peak for the same edge, k edge of aluminum. Um, and uh, because we, in this case, we don't do dipole approximation when we calculate our epsilon, so we have all the sum over epsilon to the minus qr. Uh, we also consider monopoles and uh, contributions, and therefore we have this, uh, this pre peak here in the calculation. There are other calculations uh, in the context also in, uh, of uh, elastic X-ray scattering, for, in this case for lithium fluoride. Um, and you have here the experiment of the calculation. And you basically uh, have, uh, so you have to look at the, the other, this is energy and this is uh, the Q and the, the intensity gives you uh, the loss. So you can capture the exciton dispersion that they see in the experiment when you do the calculation. So you, you see with this formalism, we can describe uh, a broad uh, spe uh, spectrum of uh, techniques. Now, uh, more related to the hands-on that we will have this afternoon, uh, just a brief uh, description of what we will calculate. So uh, going back, we will have to calculate epsilon macroscopic. Uh, so we will uh, need to calculate these matrix elements uh, and then also uh, calculate the Hamiltonian, diagonalize, uh, diagonalize it 
and get the eigen vectors and the eigen values out of it. Uh, through diagonalization, there's also other possibilities in the code, uh, not only diagonalization to get this, to get the energies, uh, but let's say we stick to diagonalization. So um, we will uh, have to provide uh, the code with the wave functions that we get uh, with uh, DFT, with Abinit. And then um, in order to construct the exotelic Hamiltonian, you know that we need to consider the, the diagonal part. For example, in the time of the uh, this would be the energies of the conduction minus the valence. This you know because you get it from DFT, but you could also get it from uh, GW. So you could do also uh, GW with a minute, or either uh, provide a scissor operator just to um, uh, shift the position of uh, the energies. Do you normally do like a rigid shift or you shift each eigenvalue? So if you use scissor, it's a rigid shift. Okay, so you do for Yes, but see, if you would like to have the all the bands recalculated, you will have to do GW and uh, then provide with a file uh, that is an output of uh, that you calculated yesterday, GW, uh, from a minute, and uh, plug, uh, use this as an input to get the energies from there. But if you don't have this and you want to just provide the wave functions and you can have the energies from DFT, you just uh, use scissor and rigidly shift uh, the spectrum. And uh, also to construct the Hamiltonian, well, you, you have to compute the Coulomb interaction. You know this is straightforward. But then uh, you have to calculate the screen Coulomb interaction, where here you will need the uh, the electric function that normal, uh, normally you calculated also with a minute in their BA. Um, so this would be another file that we will have to provide. So uh, the two things that we really need to calculate is well, do a ground state cal calculation with DFT, get the uh, wave functions, and on the other hand, also uh, calculate the electric function and uh, provide a screening file to, to, uh, to the code. The code, what we will do, uh, if you are diagonalizing, it will construct a Hamiltonian. We diagonalize it, we'll uh, extract eigen values, eigen vectors, and uh, sorry, put the bar there, um, and uh, then calculate uh, if you want to, for example, the last function. These are some of the input files that we have. We can discuss in detail this afternoon if you want. But the basically, the most important thing is that here you are specifying the kind of calculation that you will run. If you say exciton, means you will use uh, x instead of db, <laughs> because uh, many of these variables are the same that you saw before. Um, the input file and the code is, is basically the same. But with this, you will be you will use a paper, let's say, or uh, this will be the calculation. But then you can specify um, the level of uh, approximation that you would like to use. If you want to do RPA, uh, you will uh, neglect W. If you do X, you calculate the full means orbiter. You can also specify whether you like to include or not uh, local fields. So usually if you do X, uh, the, the default is that you will include the local fields. These are given by the matrix elements of the Coulomb interaction. And the default way also is the resonant meaning under Tandamkov approximation. You have to uh, say if you want to do um, the energies from GW or if you would like to see short. So, um, so you have to provide the value for, for the sister operator. And then you have to specify like uh, important parameters, the number of bands, uh, conduction and balance that you would use to construct your exotonic Hamiltonian. Uh, in here. So Loma, those occupied, and the number of bands. And then we have the broadening for the spectrum and the minus well. And as usual, we can reduce the number of plane waves that we use to compute the matrix elements uh, by uh, this uh, parameter. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can also reduce the number of G vectors with respect to the total G vectors that we have in our dielectric matrix to calculate W and uh, also uh, the final spectrum. So that's all. I'd like to thank you for your attention.
Yeah. Yes, uh, you showed a, a spectra for absorption in a very deep energy range. Yeah, 1500 EV. So how is it for to have that? You need to consider all your valence and the conduction band within uh, uh, once you've gone a diagonal to the Bessel feature. So um, in here, I use not extra, no a plane wave uh, code. I use uh, exciting, which is an all electron code. And ocean. Uh, ocean wall. you could use ocean. I didn't use ocean. In here, I use exciting. Like ocean ah, Gaussian. Ocean. I, I thought you said ocean. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, these are electrons use um, atomic orbitals for okay. you, you describe uh, an muffin team. You put atomic orbitals, and then you have also plane waves for the balance shallow cores and of course conduction. Okay. So in here you can localize and specify uh, which state. Each aluminum atom in your structure, you will uh, excite. You need to consider all of them. You just excite uh, this state and compute all the all the possible transitions to all possible conduction states that you would like to include. Okay. And uh, so you will consider, for example, an energy window about fifteen hundred states aluminum state, and then consider all possible transition from this state to wait, uh, to conduction band. Exactly. So if you see, uh, so uh, normally uh, the core states are very deep, so they are quite separated in energy with respect yeah. to other core states. So it's quite fair if you just select uh, the state in this case is the one uh, S state of aluminum. Uh, only uh, this energy. Something that could happen, uh, I don't know if in this level, but if you are in shallow course, uh, if, uh, if, for example, calculate it also with plane waves, and your structure doesn't have only one atom, but several atoms to describe the unit cell, then you don't have one level yeah, to describe probably. one band to describe that level, but you have, uh, say in this case, four, uh, which are four aluminum, four bands. And then you will have to use these four bands that describe the 2S states of the four aluminum. You cannot separate them. So you will have some coherence, uh, some interference uh, when you calculate the spectrum. But still, you don't calculate with all the balance band. You could do it if you, have, if you want to make your calculation expensive. But you would just add background, uh, a background uh, in your spectrum. Like a tail of all the other, of the optical excitations. Okay, and there is no, uh, there are computed using scissor or uh, you computed GW? Here I use scissor. Okay. okay.